You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org. These are exciting times here at North Park Baptist Church. If you are new with us today, uh, you are now part of something both beautiful and amazing and challenging all at the same time. The marriage between two churches. We've been dating since the first of the year, and four weeks ago, Pastor Derek and I got down on bended knee and asked all of you uh, if you thought that we would be better together, to which a vast majority said yes, and so we became engaged. Now, on May 19th, two weeks from now, uh, the marriage will take place. Uh, We will say I do when North Park Baptist Church uh, members and the Makers Church Board vote to legally approve the merge. If all goes anticipated and no one is left standing at the altar, (laughs) we're going to have a great party to celebrate at some point in the future. A wedding reception, if you will. Two weeks ago, uh, my son Andy Uh, got married, and he got married for the second time to the same woman. The reason for that is that a few months ago, he married a French woman uh, in France where they live. Uh, And then they had a second wedding here in San Diego for all the people in the U.S. Uh, However, uh, 40 people from France came to be part of the American wedding. Uh, Many had never been to the U.S. Uh, A number of them could not speak English. Um, So it was fun to have them experience some of our culture. Uh, And so we had Phil's barbecue at the rehearsal dinner. And then we served Mexican food at the wedding reception. Now picture that. Picture picture a plate full of barbecued ribs and chicken, uh, French fries cooked right on the spot, corn on the cob, uh, baked beans, coleslaw, and for dessert, uh, hot fruit cobbler. So that was fantastic American dinner there. And also the next day's fair, we had carne asada, pollo asada, uh, pork abodabo, and even cactus tacos, uh, plus jamaica and horchata to drink. Now, in both instances, uh, the people from France were not used to eating with their hands. Uh, I I found it very interesting. They never eat corn on the cob. It's always off the cob. And uh, so we had to uh, teach them exactly how to eat a taco. In fact, my son and daughter-in-law gave instructions on how to eat a taco uh, before they ate it. But the bottom line was this. They loved all of it. They loved all of it. However... However, not being used to a culture goes both ways. Um, I, as an American, was not used to how French people greet one another. (laughs) And that is to touch cheeks and then kiss into the air, right? Um, Most of you, maybe you know how to do this, but I'm an idiot. I don't know how to do this. Uh, I don't have a clue. So my kids showed me how to do it ahead of time. But they warned me, listen, if you don't smooch loud enough... It's an insult. Uh Uh-oh, that's right. So my new daughter-in-law and her family, I love them to pieces. They're delightful people. Uh, So the last thing I wanted to do was insult them, right, Uh, and their friends. And so I was a little nervous about not smooching loud enough. (laughs) Not only that, but I kept having problems remembering which side you go in first. Right? Uh, do you touch the right cheek to, to, to their right cheek, or do you touch your left cheek to their left cheek first? So the first time I try to do this, I, with my daughter-in-law's father, you know, here we go. And so I start moving in. I'm a little nervous about the smooching noise, and I'm thinking, do I go left or right? I start to panic. And, and then so I go right, he goes left, and we end up looking face-to-face, about to lock lips with each other. Oh, my goodness. I abort. I back out. It's like, oh, no, no. Mm-mm. So uh, I, 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 I just asked, I said, which side do I go in first? <sighs> he was howling with laughter, just howling with laughter. I was dying. 
So why do I tell you this? Why do I tell you all this? Because as well as uh, a courtship, as our courtship has been going along so good, as well as it's been going along, there are still things that we're going to be learning about each other even after the wedding. Now, this is true whenever you get two people together, uh, regardless of the backgrounds. I'm still discovering things about my wife, Glenda. Uh, good things after all, after 20 years. 20 years, good things, good things. All right. <laughs> and I know that we as two churches are going to continue to discover good things uh, about each other in the years to come. Well, today, you're going to learn a little bit more about the culture you're getting yourself into here, especially if you're new to both churches. And a number of you are so excited, are new to both of us. So we're we're excited about that. Now, how I want to do that today is I want to serve you up a plate, serve you up a plate of oikos, prayer, and the power of God. North Park Baptist style. So... I realize that you already like this dish. Uh, That's part of the reason that we're attracted to one another in the first place. But today I want you to sit back, I want you to relax, and let myself, Pastor Rob, and Eric do the cooking. All right? I'm going to cook up some oikos, Pastor Rob's going to cook up some prayer, and Eric is going to serve out the power of God. So that said, let me first give you an appetizer. Let me give, give you an appetizer. Uh, to whet your appetite for what's coming up. And that is that Jesus has a calling on your life. Jesus has a calling on your life to be his representative. Now, uh, Pastor Mark and I uh, have a mutual love affair for the verse I'm about to read. He mentioned it last week. I've mentioned it before. You're going to hear it a million times in the future. Uh, And that is this. After a person becomes a follower of Jesus, that isn't it. There's something else that needs to happen. That's just the beginning. And then Paul talked to to the people in in Corinth. He says, you guys are a new creation in Christ. And we sang about that earlier. And he said this in in, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.18. He said this, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them. Isn't that great? And he is committed to, now listen, listen, I need help here. He he committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Now, so whether you realize realize it or not, you have a calling on your life. You have a calling to be God's ambassador or to be Christ's ambassador, to be his representative to the world. Now, if I start to think about that, I don't know. You know, at first it may seem a little bit overwhelming. Who am I to do that, right? How on earth can I do that? Oh, I'm weak, I'm weak, I'm I'm a mess at times. Uh, I can't do that. Well, the good news is, is that God can use every single one of us here to do just that. Regardless of how messy we think we are or broken or weak or hurting or untalented or, or, or even think we're a, a total failure, God can use each one of us to be his representatives. In fact, Jesus said that when we acknowledge the fact that we're weak and need his help, his power will rest on us. Look at this. It says in, in, in 2 Corinthians 12:9. But Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may what? Rest on me. That's where oikos, prayer, and the power of God come in. When it comes to Jesus' representatives, we don't have to do it on our own strength. We don't have to do it. Paul said this, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. Underline that in your mind. God has been making it grow. And the same is true for you and me today. God is going to work in power in your life to cause your spiritual life to grow and make an impact on the world around you. Even if you think you're a spiritual failure. 
Now, with that said, let's start by asking the question, what is oikos? What is oikos? Um, yes, I know it's Greek yogurt. I eat it all the time, all right? <laughs> but today, we're going to be looking at, what, at the oikos found in the Bible. If you go to your Greek friends and ask them what oikos means, they're not going to know this, because this is classical Greek, which the New Testament was written in, and it literally means household, household. We use oikos to mean the people in your relational world. Let me say that again. Oikos is the people in your relational world. Now, my first exposure to oikos was decades ago. Glenn and I were at a church conference. Uh, It was taking place at a big church up in Victorville, a high desert church. It was exploding. Interestingly, it was a church very much like this one, older church, lots of history. But then they started reaching out to people by using what's known as the oikos principle, and it just exploded. Um, As we were listening to their senior pastor, Tom Mercer, uh, describe oikos, I I looked over at Glenda. Glenda always takes notes, and uh, at one point I looked down and she wrote this. This is what she wrote in her notes. I'll, I'll always forget this. I'll never forget this. It says this, I can do this, and it underlined it. Now, over the years, I've learned that if my wife likes something, especially in the spiritual realm, I better pay attention. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well, what was Tom teaching on the time? He's talking about the Gerasene demoniac. We've talked about this before. We'll talk about it again. It's this. Let me just refresh your memory. Jesus encounters a man that is filled with a legion of demons. Uh, He lives in the tombs outside of town uh, and was so strong that chains couldn't hold him. Nobody in town could subdue him. And yet the demons were terrified of Jesus and begged him to send them into a bunch of pigs, which he did. And the herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep cliff and went into into the lake and drowned. When the townspeople came out and saw what was happening, uh, and then they saw the man who had been, been possessed by demons just sitting there and dressed in his right mind, they, they just freaked out. They, beg, they were afraid. They begged Jesus to get out of there, go away. This isn't good. And we pick it up at Mark 5, 18 through 20. Mark 5, 18 through 20. It says this, as Jesus was getting into the boat, The man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people, that's your oikos, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis, that would be like telling in, in San Diego, how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Now, this is oikos, telling your own people, the people in your relational world, how much the Lord has done for you and how the Lord has had mercy on you. Now, let's hit pause and ask this question. Who are my own people? If we're going to go to our own people, who are in my oikos? Now, the people that you have meaningful relationships with. That's where we're going to start. People that you live with, people that you go to school with, people that you work with, people that you play with, and the people that God brings supernaturally across your path every day. <clears throat> Experts tell us that we have 7 to 15 people in our oikos. Some of you have a lot more, some of you have less. And there's a saying that's used in business, and it's this. If you try to reach everyone you're going to end up reaching no one. It's quoted over and over in the business world to get people to focus on their own particular strengths, their own particular niche. Same is true in the spiritual world. If, I try to, if you try to reach everybody for Jesus, you're going to end up reaching nobody. Oikos simplifies things. You just need to, pe- to focus on the people in your relational world. Now, part of your homework, this way, I'm going to give you some homework. I want you to start looking around and go, okay, who is in my oikos? And I actually want you to start writing them down and making a list. To get ahead of myself, I'm going to ask you in the future to start praying for them. But here's the deal. Obviously, there's people in your oikos that you live with, that you you have to be with, uh, go go to work with. But 
Keep an eye open for people that have similar interests and personalities to you. Uh, I work on old cars. I love work. I like resurrecting dead old cars from the dead. And I have met a lot of my non-believing friends in my oikos I've met through the car world. Many of you have people in your oikos because of shared interests, things such as sports, um, cooking, food, music, you name it. There is some, some great places that you can connect with people in that area of your life. And I want you, again, to write those people down on your list. <coughs> Excuse me. Can you see where this is going? Can you see why Glenda said, I can do this? It's because the number of people that we are to be Jesus' representative to now becomes more manageable. Yes. Now, and the people that we are already sharing part of our life with, those are the people that we are to be Jesus to. One other thing, we are to be Jesus to them using our own particular strengths and gifts. Things that in ways that fit our personalities. I don't know about you, but, but this is huge to me. And part of the reason that I started thinking, you know, even I could do this. Even I can do this. And you're going to hear more about this in the days to come. But you know this, you do not have to be an extrovert. You don't have to be, uh, have a spiritual gift of evangelism uh, to, to make Jesus known. You, you don't. I'm a total introvert. I'm a spiritual wimp. And yet oikos is perfect for me. So if you are those things, you don't have to admit it in public like I do, but it's, it's going to be perfect for you. Now that said, today I want to talk more specifically about why oikos works. Why oikos works. Why does oikos work when it comes to making Jesus known and reaching people for Jesus? Now I say this time and time again, but study after study after study has shown that 90% or more people come to Christ through an oikos relationship. 90% or more, not because of an evangelistic crusade, not because of a, a pastor, not because of a church program, not because of a TV program, although all those things are good and are used, 90% of people come to Christ through a oikos relationship. And if you're a betting person, not that you are, you bet with those kind of odds are good, right? So why is that? Why does oikos work? Well, there are a ton of reasons, but today I'm going to look at two. Two reasons why oikos works. First of all, oikos is God's plan. Oikos is God's plan. The second is that oikos has God's power, which we can access through prayer. So let's start with oikos being God's plan. God's plan to reach the world for Jesus is by using personal relationships. Your personal relationships, my personal relationships. Relationships are everything. Trust me, knowing myself, that would not be my plan, right? <laughs> but again, prayer and the power of God can make up for our weakness. Not only that, when a person comes to faith in Jesus, God's plan is not that that would be an isolated event, but that it would affect everybody around them. It's, it's the ripple effect. If you throw a rock into the, into the pond, you know, it, it makes this impact on the surface of water, and, it, and out it goes. Uh, everything around it is changed on the surface. Or take this cold or cough going around, or the measles for that, for that matter. Coming to faith in Jesus should be just as contagious, but in a good way, right? Which brings us to our wake-up moment of the day. If you are here and you're asleep, that's okay, but this is the wake-up moment. <laughs> When a person comes to faith in Jesus, their faith should be so contagious that other people in their oikos should come to Jesus as well. Amen. Now that's God's plan, and we see this over and over in the Bible. And I can't emphasize this enough, it is not up to you. It is not up to you for this to work. Prayer and the power of God need to be involved. Okay, let me give you some examples. First of all, Jesus heals an official son. Jesus heals an official son. <clears throat> when Jesus was in Galilee, there was a royal official whose son was on, on his deathbed. And so the royal official went to Jesus and he begged him, oh, please come and heal my son. Well, let's pick him up, pick it up 
Here it says, the royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time that his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole, what? Household. Household, His oikos believed. Who believed? It wasn't just him. It wasn't just his son. But the whole oikos believed. That's God's power at work. That's God's power at work. That's a miracle, right? God is going to work in your life. Maybe not as spectacular as this, but When people see God working in your life, the people in your oikos are going to take notice. And so we need to pray that God would open their spiritual eyes. Now, i got to pause here. One huge point I need to make here you may not want to hear today. And that is there are people in your oikos that you may not want to see come to Jesus. But God does. One of the first persons that Jesus called to be his disciple was Levi, who was a tax collector. And if you remember, tax collectors back then were just notoriously corrupt. Take a look at Mark 2. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, that is his oikos, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were the Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and the tax collectors and asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Upon hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Now look at this. I have not come to call the righteous, but who? Sinners. Sinners. That's right. As shocking as this may sound, Jesus wants you to eat with sinners. Especially the sinners in your oikos. Now here's something to ponder. When you make your list of people that are in your oikos, look how many non-believers are in there. Or nasty people. There needs to be people like that in your oikos. Those may be the very people that God has supernaturally placed in your life for you to be Jesus' representative to. Now, the guess, my guess is that many of us, especially myself, were those type of people in somebody else's oikos before we came to Christ. Well, wow, that's right. <laughs> Moving forward, we see the oikos principle working in the early church. Very quickly, Cornelius, the first Gentile. Uh, God told Peter to go to him, house full of Gentiles. He's going, oh, they're all nasty and uh, unclean. But after Peter told him the gospel, the whole, God, the whole household came to Christ. And then Paul uh, and Silas were thrown into jail. And uh, in Philippi, God sent an earthquake and angels and let them go. And as a result of that, the jailer was thinking, oh, I'm going to kill myself. I'm not going to be killed anyway. I'm killing myself. But Paul intervened. Look at this. Acts 16, 29, the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your oikos. Right? You and your household. I get excited about this. So... Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them, and he was filled with joy because he had become to believe in God. He and his whole household, oikos, Trust me, people, God is going to use you supernaturally to affect the people in your oikos, in your relational world. And Rob is going to come tell us about prayer because you can't do it yourself. God doesn't expect you to do it yourself. He's going to give you power. So, Rob, come on up here and and talk to us. Do you need to do this? Okay. Uh, Let's get your hand out. Oh, here it is right here. Okay, good morning. I'm... uh here we go. Lance. So I lost my notes. <laughs> oh, yes, I guess I do. I told you I'm technologically challenged. What can I say? 
Anyway, I'm supposed to talk on prayer, and uh, for me, what prayer is is simply talking to God. That's, that's all it is. People make it sound like it's this big spiritual thing, you know, and all it is is just communication. It's, act, it's asking God to step in and to do what we can't do. I'm a person who is not sympathetic, but I am empathetic. And what I mean by that is I can understand why people do what they do, but I don't feel sorry because they did it. Because there's nothing I can do to change it. And I usually figure that if you're smart enough to get into a situation, you're smart enough to get out of it. And uh, I'm also one of those people who is a mentally ill magnet. I can be somewhere with my kids in a picnic. I can be at a museum or anywhere, and mentally ill people just come to me and start talking. And so I sit down with them and I listen. And uh, I do because I feel like everybody needs somebody to listen to. You know, we all sit here and we look so good. We look so good on Sunday morning. <laughs> but we're all like oceans or universes. Um, on the top is very placid and very peaceful. But underneath, there's stuff that's dying. There's stuff that's, that's coming alive. There's emotions. There's storms. And all of us have uh, soul wounds. And what I mean by that is uh, you, can't, you can't grow up without somebody having hurt you. You've either been bullied or people have said hurtful things to you or people have treated you badly and we respond to those things. And so when I look at people, I don't make judgments because I don't know what um, causes them to function the way they function. But um, for, for me, the Bible is... Um, it's a love letter to me, but it's also a manifesto of war against the kingdom of darkness. And if you miss those two, those two tensions, you miss the purpose of God. You know, we live in a time when people want to say, well, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. In a way, yes, but in a way, no. God is my uh, commander in chief. God is my king, God is my life, God is my creator. He's more than I can understand, he's more than I can handle at times. And um, one of the things I think about when I come to prayer is that it, in Ephesians 6, um, when it talks about uh, prayer and putting on the full armor of God, it says in the end, stand, and then verses 18 through 20 say, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And for me, that's a, a life verse. Um, <laughs> you know, in my life, I've been accused a lot of things. I've been called a lot of things. But one thing I know, and when I stand before the throne, what God can say is he tried to be faithful. <laughs> he tried. <laughs> it's like my kids say, Dad, you try to be, you try to be, uh, what's that word, Stephanie? <laughs> I love that woman. <laughs> uh, sensitive, that's the word. Yeah, they say, I, Dad, you try to be sensitive, but stop talking to people because you hurt their feelings. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, one of the things that I think that um, as Christians that what we must know is that we live in a dual dimensions. John 3, verses 3 through 8, Jesus replied, he was talking to Nicodemus. He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asks. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God 
unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. That what we do is we hold attention that we are natural, natural creation, creations with eternity within us. You know, the Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if that's true, that also means that we are royal priests and kings. That our job is to stand before God on behalf of the people and to stand before the people on behalf of God. And so if you're in my oikos and you come to mind, I will pray for you because I don't know what's going on. And the other thing is, is I ain't Jesus. I ain't got the answers. So, <laughs> so what I will do, though, is I will say, okay, God, I don't know what's going on. I hope they ain't acting like they was dropped on their head when, when they was a baby. But uh, whatever it is, please help them get out of it. Love them. Protect them. Provide for them. Bring them peace. Bring them comfort, God. And most of all, draw them close to yourself. I don't, um, when I first began to pray, I used to ask uh, for specific things for people. And then I realized, I don't know what they need. I don't even know what I need half the time. And so it's like, if, if God is your God, he knows what you need. And he'll answer it in his way anyway. And so... But I will be standing there on your behalf, saying, God bless them. Glenn already read the thing about ambassadors. And um, <clears throat> that's 2 Corinthians 5.20. And one thing about an ambassador is whatever, wherever an ambassador walks, the country walks. The ambassador of the United States, wherever the ambassador of the United States is, that's the United States where he stands or she stands. And so wherever you walk and wherever you stand, that's the kingdom of God. If you are God's person. So I'm drawing to a close here. I got two minutes. So, uh, <laughs> so what I want to do is I want to bless you. I want to bless you with the ability to see God and to hear God. I want to bless you with the ability to be safe within his arms I want to bless you with the ability to be able to trust him with all the things in your life that you're afraid of and to believe that he has a purpose and a plan for you and that he's going to take you to places that you can never imagine or think and that we are, we are God's creation, but we are also joint heirs with Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, so we've got oikos, we've got prayer, and now we're going to serve up some of the power of God. And so this, if you haven't met Eric, this is Eric, and uh, he has, we've been cheering you on because you have now become a year, uh, over a year. Over a year. So hold up the microphone. Over a year. I have 378 days clean and sober and as a Christian as well. Uh, thank you. So uh, tell us. Tell us your story. Tell us. Well, I, I woke up this morning really excited because uh, not to come in here and tell everybody what a bad guy used to be, but uh, we serve a, a, a merciful, a loving God, and I, and I, and I can prove it. Uh, so so I, I grew up, I was in my 20s, and I grew up uh, addicted to drugs, alcoholic, uh, atheist, uh, one of those guys who was full of blasphemy. I used to talk bad about the Lord. I used to... Uh, have a foul mouth, and uh, had no desire to be a part of the community of society. I was just interested in being a drug dealer and having a girlfriend and being alone and with drugs and money, and, and, and so that was my, my day. So I didn't realize that I was just wallowing in sin constantly all day. I didn't, I didn't know. I thought I was doing good. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said well, this is cool. I'm, uh, I'm doing really good, better than the most. I don't have to work. I'm, I'm having fun all day long, and, and uh uh, nobody cared. I'm not doing anything wrong. So I thought I was well off. And uh, I met a lot of bad people, a lot of real bad people. And one of the people I met uh, was a, uh, he, I, he had tattoos all over him, uh, satanic tattoos. He was a devil worshiper uh, slash pagan. 
and he admitted it. And I've seen the guy do supernatural things. I don't have time to explain it. But the thing is, is that uh, I've been chasing this particular woman around for, for about six, seven months. And she had come right up and she told me, she goes, look, Eric, it's not going to happen to you. It's not going to happen with us. You're not my type. Just forget about it. There's no possible way. I'm tired of spending all your money and drugs and just forget it. You go somewhere, I'll find someone else. And so I was in love with her. I was love at first sight. And so I get locked up, and this pagan comes up to me. And he goes, you know, Eric, I've seen you chasing this woman around. He goes, uh, for 18 months now. He goes, uh, he goes, would you sell your soul for this woman? And being an atheist, I don't believe in souls. I said, sure, yeah, yeah I would. So I get out of prison, and she's at my door. And uh, I was with her for about five years as a girlfriend. So I didn't think nothing else about it. And then... Um, you know, again, I thought I was doing good. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians uh, 4, 4, it says, Satan, who is God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light that the, of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Well, amen. Because people try to explain to me about Jesus, and I, I, I just didn't get it. I, I didn't make any sense to me. So uh, I'm, I'm in my 40s now, and I forgot all about this woman. She's gone, you know, she's so, so uh, selling my soul for her. I forgot all about that, too. So I'm still full of blasphemy, and, and, and I'm cursing the Lord all the time. And so uh, the, the book of 1 Samuel 16, 14 says, Now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with a depression and fear. And I'm going to tell you, I was also hit with that tormenting spirit. I, I, I don't get scared easy. I've been to the penitentiary, and suddenly one day I was at a bus stop, and I just got so terrified that I got up and started running, and I actually crawled down into the sewer system, not, not the poop one, just the water one. So I, <laughs> I, <laughs> but there was a tube, a round tube, about that big, and so I'm scurrying along, trying, thinking I can hear people chasing me. And uh, Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked run away when no one is chasing them. But the godly are as bold as lions. Yeah. Amen. 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 And, 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 and I thought somebody was chasing me. So <laughs> I get lost in this sewer system. And passage, I, I finally, after prayer, I don't believe in God, but I said, God, please don't let me die in the sewer. <laughs> please, please, God, don't let me die in the sewer. So anyway, uh, I scream for help. I see this van, and Pastor Derek cuts me out. And while he's cutting me out, I see flames coming at me. Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to stop right here. So yeah. you're lost in the sewer system. You're looking through some bars. You can't get out. You can't get the out. The fire department comes. Yes. Who is it but Pastor Derek? Pastor Derek. All right. <laughs> so, so he cuts me out. He cuts me out of the sewer. This, trust me, it was a fiery type of thing because they're, they're cutting the fire. Flames were coming at me. So... So I end up cursing the Lord again a few months later. I end up in a jail. I'm running out of time. I run up into jail. And uh, at that point, when I got out of the jail, sitting in the jail, I was thinking, oh, I sold my soul for this moment. I'm going to hell. And, uh, oh, God. I tell, tell, talking about living in fear. So I was very terrified. And uh, the last passage I have, uh, 1 John says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. Well, I went out on my girlfriend's balcony after all this, and I said, God, if, 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 uh, if you let me go to heaven, everybody get to go. So I know I can't go to heaven, but just, just maybe blot me out when, uh, when I die. I, but but uh, I'm a sinner. I confess my sins to you right now. I, I repent. Uh, I ask for mercy, Lord, and I do uh, accept you, Lord Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. And... Uh, and I said amen, and I did it more than once. And I'll tell you what, I woke, the next day I woke up, and I didn't want to use a drink again anymore. And then I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and now today I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. And I am going to heaven, and anyone can go to heaven <laughs> if they accept the Jesus. So I just want to say, it hasn't been a struggle with me. I didn't have to try to stay clean. I didn't want to stay clean. It's just the power of God. Uh, uh, it was overwhelming. Uh, I, the Holy Spirit uh, has taken over my life and uh, removed my desire to drink or use. So, just one thing. I want, the last thing I want to say is just praise God. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. All right.
Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful that you care about the least of these, the greatest of these. Lord, you care about us. You care about people that are in our oikos, even the people we don't like. And so, Lord, use us. Lord, we freely admit that we can't do it on our own. Jesus, you said, apart from you, we can do nothing. But with you, we can do all things. And so, Lord, give us a sense of expectancy in the days to come that you are going to use us. You are going to use our lives. No matter how weak or broken we think we are, that you, your power, we just heard how your power can transform lives, transform our lives, transform those in our oikos, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray all this. Amen. You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org.